Marilyn Monroe is an icon of the 20th century. Her blonde bombshell image won the hearts of millions around the world. Marilyn epitomized beauty. Her journey to becoming Hollywood's most glamorous and beautiful star surprisingly stemmed from a childhood of poverty and neglect. Marilyn was always an underdog. We love the underdog to win. The continued fascination with Marilyn derives in part from the untimeliness of her death. Her great enemy was sleeplessness. Only God knows why she feared it so much. Her stardom has only escalated since her departure. And her incredible beauty still stirs our hearts. There is only one Marilyn. I thank you very much. It's been said that Monroe played the best game with the worst hand. She was born as an illegitimate child and named Norma Jean Baker. Norma Jean endured a childhood of poverty, misery, and abuse. She spent years in foster homes and orphanages, and her mother was institutionalized after suffering a nervous breakdown. She escaped from this horrific life at the age of 16 with an arranged marriage. Her husband disapproved of her newly found modeling career and the marriage broke down. Marilyn later reflected, No one ever told me I was pretty when I was a little girl. All little girls should be told they're pretty, even if they aren't. She headed to Hollywood with a dream. It was the golden age of Hollywood when the film industry was extremely affluent and powerful. Paramount, 20th Century Fox, and MGM were the most successful studios of the era. And were producing a huge volume of movies that gave birth to dozens of stars. Industry Luncheon, why Frank Freeman, board chairman of the Motion Picture Producers Association, presents the stars. Here, Rhonda Fleming. Also on the receiving line with their majesties is California's Governor Goodwin J. Knight. A gracious greeting from producer-director Cecil B. DeMille. Mary Pickford, followed by her husband, Buddy Rogers. June Allison, and her husband, Dick Powell. That's Cary Grant, next in line after Powell. Norma Jean dreamed of joining her idols and becoming a star. She would later say, Dreaming about being an actress is more exciting than being one. Norma Jean won a one-year contract at 20th Century Fox and changed her name to Marilyn Monroe. In the years that followed, she was cast in a number of small roles and was given a seven-year deal with Fox Studios. But Marilyn was broke. There were no movie offers on the horizon and very few modeling jobs coming her way. Marilyn recalled later, I used to think, as I looked out on the Hollywood night, there must be thousands of girls sitting alone like me, dreaming of becoming a movie star. But I'm not going to worry about them. I'm dreaming the hardest. She was asked to pose nude for a calendar. Due to her financial trouble, she agreed and was paid a measly 50 US dollars for the shoot. Sales of the calendar reached 8 million copies. And Playboy magazine used the pictures in its first issue. These photographs catapulted Marilyn Monroe to superstardom. She was later quoted as saying, Hollywood is a place where they'll pay you a thousand dollars for a kiss and 50 cents for your soul. Her first serious acting role came the following year when she had a small but crucial role in the asphalt jungle and received favorable reviews. In addition to her newly found acting career in films such as All About Eve and Ladies of the Chorus, Marilyn was required to pose for publicity photos. These photos attracted the attention of servicemen, 
film fans and newspaper editors from all around the world. They also caught the eye of legendary baseball player Joe DiMaggio. He promptly made contact and asked Marilyn out on a date. DiMaggio, up for the Yanks in the fateful fifth, gets a single off Brooklyn's Ralph Franklin. It's New York's first hit of the day. Marilyn was reluctant to meet DiMaggio for she didn't follow baseball and was not attracted to sports figures. Joe DiMaggio thrills Japanese baseball fans in Tokyo. Despite their differences, the unlikely couple began dating as DiMaggio had made a good first impression. I had a thought. I was going to meet a loud, sporty fellow. Instead, I found myself smiling at a reserved gentleman. If I hadn't been told he was some sort of ball player, I would have guessed he was either a steel magnet or a congressman. Joe's courtship of Marilyn fascinated the world. But their relationship was fraught with problems almost from the beginning, mostly stemming from the public nature of Marilyn's career. DiMaggio was a shy man who shunned publicity and the press, whilst Marilyn's career thrived on it. Marilyn's career was going from strength to strength, thanks to the box office success of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Marilyn and Jane Russell were asked to place their prints and signatures in the cement of the forecourt of Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. She was now clearly a movie star. But Marilyn could not believe it. There was my name up in lights. I said, God, somebody's made a mistake. But there it was, in lights. And I sat there and said, Remember, you're not a star, yet there it was, up in lights. Despite her beautiful and relaxed public persona, Marilyn suffered from great insecurities about her acting abilities. She often needed to bolster her confidence before appearing on set, which led to keeping her co-stars waiting for several hours, and many considered her unprofessional. I am invariably late for appointments, sometimes as much as two hours. I've tried to change my ways, but the things that make me late are too strong and too pleasing. Although her tardiness only worsened, Marilyn featured in three consecutive box office hits in 1953, a streak of good fortune that made her the most popular movie star the following year. The glamorous bombshell of the currently showing Cinemascope production, How to Marry a Millionaire, and who soon will be seen in River of No Return, another Cinemascope triumph, is overwhelmed by her designation. Marilyn Monroe, it gives me the greatest pleasure to present the famous Photoplay Magazine Gold Medal Award as the selection of all of the moviegoers of America who have voted you the most popular actress of the year. My congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Sims. I want to thank the editors of Photoplay magazine and all of the public. I thank you very much. Armed with unprecedented popularity, Marilyn demanded more control over her future roles as well as a better salary from 20th Century Fox. The studio threatened to dismiss her. Apparently unfazed by the studio threats, Marilyn responded by marrying Joe DiMaggio. If I'd observed all the rules, I'd never have got anywhere. A career is wonderful, but you can't curl up with it on a cold night. Marilyn gained a lot of public and media support as a result of her marriage to the American Idol. A few days after the wedding, Fox relented and told Marilyn all would be forgiven if she came back to work. A truce was finally worked out in which Marilyn's salary was improved. After a few days in Palm Springs, the couple went to Japan on their honeymoon. At Tokyo's international airport, the masses of fans, photographers, and reporters were so manic in their enthusiasm for Marilyn and Joe that the couple had to scramble back to their airplane. 
The honeymooners managed to escape a short time later through a baggage hatch. Over to Tokyo, where the land of the rising sun bows to a twinkling star. It's Marilyn Monroe and her husband, Joe DiMaggio, on their honeymoon. And if we figure this goodwill correctly, we'd better send Miss Great Britain to Berlin. During this time, the Korean War was raging only miles away from Japan. Frontline report. From somewhere in South Korea in these Defense Department films, U.S. infantrymen fighting a rearguard action battle snipers in a burning town. At a cocktail party in Tokyo, a high-ranking American Army officer asked Marilyn if she would consider entertaining the troops stationed in Korea. Marilyn was thrilled at the request, though Joe was concerned about the potential danger involved. It's believed that Marilyn left for Korea over DiMaggio's serious objections. Marilyn's side trip to the war field became a serious point of contention between the newlyweds. Monroe invades frozen Korea, and the G.I.s come a running, vowing unconditional surrender. The screen star has come for a four-day, ten-show tour of the front. Marilyn proves that there's nothing drab about G.I. slacks and shirt, depending on how you look at it, as she heads for her first performance. 13,000 Marines whoop it up as a now glamorous Marilyn steps front and center, while MPs have their hands full. Having the time of her life, Marilyn wriggles her way into the hearts of the Leathernecks. Coyly, she admits, I've never seen so many men in all my life. Marilyn would say more than once in her life that the adulation she felt in Korea from the servicemen had helped overcome a fear of performing in front of large crowds. It was the high point of her career. The trip was the best thing that ever happened to me. I never felt like a star before in my heart. It was so wonderful to look down and see a fellow smiling at me. She performed for the American Marines in bitter, cold temperatures, wearing only a scanty plum-colored dress. Marilyn sang Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, Bye Bye Baby, and Do It Again. She interrupted her performances to use her fine comic wit and crack jokes with the soldiers about their fondness for sweater girls. Marilyn must come and go, and Korea, for the GIs, can never be the same. Marilyn returned to Japan from her exhausting trip with a 104 degree temperature and a slight case of pneumonia. Full of confidence, Marilyn successfully negotiated her way into the lead role in the seven-year itch. This demonstrated the power she now had over the studio executives. But personally, Joe and Marilyn were experiencing problems and spent a great deal of time apart. During the filming of the famous skirt-blowing scene in the seven-year itch, DiMaggio walked onto the set dismayed at the sight of his wife and called out, What the hell's going on here? Joe had great disdain for not only the public display of Marilyn's physical charms, but also for her profession, which required it. Shortly after this highly publicized event, Marilyn and Joe filed for divorce. Later, Marilyn reflected, I guess I've always been deeply terrified to really be someone's wife. Since I know from life one cannot love another, ever really. The Seven Year Itch was a box office hit, and Marilyn became embroiled in another dispute with Fox. She decided to leave Hollywood for New York to study acting. She formed her own production company to secure better roles. Marilyn was determined to become a serious dramatic actress with or without the studio. She befriended intellectuals and started seeing American playwright Arthur Miller. Finally, Fox Studios met Marilyn's unprecedented demands, which included story and director approval. Her salary was boosted to $100,000 US dollars per film, and she was allowed to make films with independent producers and other studios. 
Maryland's victory not only became a landmark case, but again it proved that Marilyn Monroe was a force to be reckoned with. I'm not interested in money. I just want to be wonderful. My work is the only ground I've ever had to stand on. I seem to have a whole superstructure with no foundation. But I'm working on the foundation. In high spirits, she returned to Hollywood to star in the film Bust Up. Her performance in the film is considered the finest of her career. After the completion of Bust Up, Marilyn returned to New York and married Arthur Miller in a small civil ceremony. She not only adored her new husband, but she admired him for his talent and accomplishments. Marilyn then flew to London to begin work on her next film, The Prince and the Showgirl. Miller accompanied her despite having been called to testify before the House on American Activities Committee to explain his supposed communist affiliations. A honeymoon couple arrive at London Airport, Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Miller. Mrs. Miller's better known as Marilyn Monroe. Arthur is one of America's most brilliant playwrights. He wrote Death of a Salesman. Marilyn's come to England to film The Sleeping Prince with Sir Laurence Olivier, who's here with his wife to meet them. A marriage of brains and beauty. But don't let anyone tell you Arthur's got all the brains. Mr. Miller, what is the next stage in your trouble with the United States Congress? Well, the uh, next stage is that the Congress itself uh, vote one way or another on the consent citation uh, voted by one of its committees. Yes. And uh, if it does so vote, then the next stage after that is that this is sent to the Attorney General of the United States, who then takes the matter to a federal court, and there is a trial as to whether I was in fact in contempt, which I don't believe, and uh, or whether I was not. And might you be liable to a term of imprisonment? Well, it's very rarely, if ever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. meted out. Are you going to stick to your guns on this? Oh, definitely. Yes. Well, could you remind our viewers just exactly what your stand is? You are saying you are refusing to reveal the names of certain people. Is that correct? There's certain writers I knew in ten years ago or so. Were who, you actually uh, a member of the Communist Party no, yourself was, at one time? I was attended several meetings. Yes. That were meetings of Communist yes. writers. Yes. Yes. Have you been to England before? I was here in 1949 when Death of a Salesman was produced here. A little, a, little, a little quieter for you that time, isn't it? Yeah, well, I was in the theater most of the time. Good. Are you enjoying your honeymoon? Very much, yes. Good. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. During the proceedings, Marilyn supported Miller both privately and publicly, telling newsreel reporters that she believed her husband would win his case. Later, begrudgingly, Miller paid a fine of 500 U.S. dollars to have the matter settled. Here she is at the Savoy Hotel, stepping into a blaze of light at her press reception. Escorted by publicist Robert Stanage and with Sir Lawrence Olivia, she took her seat in the center of it all. Soon they were joined by her husband, Arthur Miller, looking, I thought, surprisingly calm and unruffled. We were delighted by the quickness of her mind and her intelligence. Talking with her about her new British film, The Sleeping Prince, I was immediately struck by her obvious enthusiasm for this new venture. The film's name was changed to The Prince and the Showgirl and was the first independent project undertaken by Marilyn Monroe Productions. Monroe co-starred with Laurence Olivier, who also directed the film. He became frustrated with Marilyn, often raising his voice in anger and occasionally insulting her. Marilyn responded by arriving on the set hours late, sometimes failing to show up at all. Miller assumed the duties of caretaker and manager for his unstable wife, and was often placed in the awkward position of having to explain or defend Marilyn's behavior. Marilyn fell into a pattern of chronic insomnia, often becoming hysterical as the long nights wore on. Nightly vigils by her side became a common experience for Miller. A clearly disturbed Marilyn once said, First I'm trying to prove to myself that I'm a person. Then maybe I'll convince myself that I'm an actress. 
During the production of The Prince and the Showgirl, Marilyn was invited to attend a Royal Command film performance before Queen Elizabeth. This was the scene in London's Leicester Square on the evening chosen for the greatest event in the cinema year. The film selected for the royal performance was The Battle of the River Plate. One of the earliest arrivals was Marilyn Monroe and her husband Arthur Miller. Next, the crowd gave a warm welcome to the British stars. John Gregson plays the part of Captain Bell in this picture of naval battle. Marilyn was presented to Queen Elizabeth, who complimented her on her curtsy. After the filming of The Prince and the Showgirl, Marilyn suffered her first miscarriage. Her unpleasant behavior and her increasing dependency on her husband strained their marriage considerably. She later said, The thing I want more than anything else, I want to have children. I used to feel for every child I had, I would adopt another. Almost two years later, she returned to the set for the production of Some Like It Hot. Marilyn's drug use and increasing dependence on alcohol held up production and pushed the film over budget. Yet financially, the film was hugely successful and one of Marilyn's most popular films. Sadly, after production was completed, Marilyn suffered another miscarriage. Meanwhile, Miller had completed the script and assembled the cast for their eagerly anticipated production of the film, The Misfits. His dramatic and thoughtful script promised to showcase Marilyn's acting talents to their fullest extent. But 20th Century Fox quickly burst everybody's bubble with the news that Marilyn needed to fulfill her contractual obligations to the studio. She finally agreed to star in the musical comedy entitled, Let's Make Love. The disappointment of her miscarriage led her to become vindictive and unfaithful to her husband. Let's Make Love was not the box office hit that Fox executives were counting on. Finally, Marilyn could embark on the production of The Misfits that also starred her idol, Clark Gable. From the outset, the movie seemed doomed as Marilyn's personal problems became even greater. She grew increasingly bitter towards Miller, directing all of her hostility and frustrations at him. Marilyn then suffered a breakdown and spent 10 days in hospital, and the production was temporarily shut down. Clark Gable's participation in The Misfits must have seemed to Marilyn like a gift from the gods. Her adulation of Gable went all the way back to her childhood when she had fantasized that the handsome actor was her father. The grueling location shoot of The Misfits was made more unbearable by the long waits for Marilyn. Publicly, Gable showed no anger or hostility towards the obviously ill actress. On set, Marilyn stated, The place was full of so-called men, but Clark was the one who brought a chair for me between the takes. Yet privately, Gable admitted his frustrations with Marilyn's behavior and hinted at his growing fatigue from participating in the film. The Misfits opened to mixed reviews and had poor box office results. After filming concluded, Marilyn and Miller finally separated. Marilyn attempted to go into seclusion, but her efforts were thwarted by the announcement of Clark Gable's death. Gable had had a massive heart attack the day after the misfits had wrapped. Rumors began to fly that Kay Gable, Clark's young widow, blamed Marilyn for her husband's death. It's said that Kay claimed that the stress Gable had had to endure during the filming of Misfits, including the daily delays and excessive heat, had led to his heart attack. Upon hearing this, Marilyn fell into a dark depression at the thought that she had caused the death of the man she considered to be the father figure of her life. In her darkest hour, Joe DiMaggio re-entered her life, 
and looked after her as much as she would allow until her death. Under the advice of her psychiatrist, she was admitted to the Payne Whitney Clinic in New York and felt dreadfully uncomfortable. DiMaggio arranged Marilyn's discharge and placed her in the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. Upon her release three weeks later, reporters and photographers bombarded Marilyn outside the hospital's doors. They surrounded her, screaming tasteless questions and blocking her exit to a waiting limousine. Sixteen police officers and hospital security men were needed to escort her to safety. In addition to her precarious emotional and mental health, Marilyn experienced a variety of physical disorders as well. She endured a gallbladder operation and suffered from an ulcerated colon and abnormal bleeding from the uterus. Because of her delicate mental and physical conditions, Marilyn did not work as an actress at all in 1961. She later admitted, Being a sex symbol is a heavy load to carry, especially when one is tired, hurt, and bewildered. Eventually, she returned to 20th Century Fox to begin work on the production, ironically named, Something's Got to Give. She had contracted a virus which left her fatigued and weakened. Realizing that Marilyn was ill, the studio executives and co-star Dean Martin agreed to arrange the shooting schedule around her. Several photographers had been invited to shoot publicity stills of a swimming pool scene in which Marilyn was supposed to wear a flesh-colored bathing suit to suggest that she was swimming nude. The photographers were surprised to find Marilyn paddling in the pool on natural. As Marilyn came out of her dressing room in this wonderful blue bathrobe, terry cloth, you know, one like you'd have lying around your own house, jumped in the swimming pool, dog paddled around, and then came up to the edge of the pool and didn't have a bra on. Well, immediately, myself and everybody on the set knew this was the first time in like 10 or 12 years that Marilyn might be photographed nude. Marilyn was very, very fussy on who photographed her. She, in fact, had approval of every one of the pictures. She would sit there with a, a grease pencil and cross them out, or pinking shears and cut them. Uh, she knew who she wanted to photograph her and when she wanted to be photographed. Fortunately, I was one of the last to ever photograph her. Out of 33 shooting days, Marilyn had showed up on the set only 12 times. Often hours late, and when she did appear, she seldom got through more than one page of script per day. She infuriated studio executives when she took off to fly to New York to sing happy birthday to President Kennedy. It was also rumored that she had had an affair with the president and his younger brother, Robert. Finally, production chief Peter LeFavs fired Marilyn from Something's Gotta Give. Marilyn was devastated by her dismissal. It's believed that in her despair, she made repeated phone calls to the Justice Department where Robert Kennedy worked shortly after she was fired. But it is also alleged that at this time, Robert and or his advisors concluded that his involvement with Marilyn was too politically dangerous to continue. Determine what it is exactly that you want to accomplish. On August 4th, 1962, Marilyn spent the day and evening making endless phone calls to her friends. And as the night grew later, her speech became more and more slurred. Then, sometime during the night, she died alone. Her phone was still clutched in her hand. Sadly, Marilyn Monroe was just 36 years of age when she passed away. Just as the press had hounded Marilyn in life, they descended upon her in death, photographing her blanketed body as it was moved out of the house and into the ambulance which would take it to the morgue. 
Director John Huston paid tribute to the actress that he knew better than most. Directed Marilyn in her first role of any consequence, The Asphalt Jungle, and in her last picture, The Misfits. A number of those who were close to her during the making of The Misfits thought it would be only a few short years before she died or went into an institution. Her great enemy was sleeplessness. Only God knows why she feared it so much. Perhaps it was simply that not to sleep meant losing her beauty, but I'm inclined to think that there was more to it than that. In any case, she fought her enemy, consciousness, with sedatives until she'd achieve not only sleeplessness, asleep, but insensibility. Then stimulants would be employed to awaken her. This vicious circle played such havoc with her body that she had to be hospitalized for 10 days in the middle of the picture. An overdose of sleeping tablets has become synonymous with suicide. It was the end of a career which, for all the fame she acquired, apparently spun itself out. The story of girlhood, insecurity, a troubled life, something perhaps encouraged, not healed, by the fame that came to her as a symbol of physical charm. Early this morning, it was revealed that she will be buried by arrangement alongside her grandmother, Emma Atchison, and her guardian, Grace Godward. It was ruled that Marilyn's death was a probable suicide. Her funeral took place at the Westwood Memorial Park Chapel in California. Joe DiMaggio made the arrangements for the funeral with help from Marilyn's half-sister, Bernice Miracle. Once more, a large contingent of press watched on as the mourners arrived. DiMaggio allowed only a few people to attend the service. Marilyn's most recent Hollywood acquaintances were noticeably absent. Perhaps in trying to come to grips with the tragic struggles of Marilyn's life, we have become obsessed with explaining her death. Since her passing, there has been endless speculation as to the cause of her death. Theories range from members of organized crime killing Marilyn to frame the Kennedys, to that the Kennedys themselves killed her to avoid a public scandal. Some also doubt that there was even a suicide, speculating that on the last night of her life, Marilyn had wanted merely to sleep through her despair, as she had done so many times before. Possibly, under the heavy influence of drugs, she simply lost track of the number of sleeping pills she had swallowed. The world's endless fascination with Marilyn Monroe has led to numerous books being written about her life and controversial death. Anthony Summers, a British journalist, penned his account back in 1985 in a book called Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe. Tony Summers, it's easy, isn't it, after 23 years when people are not around to answer back to slur their names by innuendo? I haven't slurred anybody's name by innuendo. I set out to do a biography of Marilyn Monroe's life, and had I not looked into the alleged Kennedy connection, you'd have been asking me why not. Uh, it was, in a sense, perhaps the best example to date of the power of rumour in our time. There was never, until now, evidence that she had actually had affairs with either John Kennedy or Robert Kennedy. Uh, now there are. Uh, there are major pieces of evidence from uh, witnesses, first-hand witnesses, Kennedy loyalists then and now, in some cases, who would not be expected to smear the Kennedy name. Now, this whole case is being reopened in Los Angeles, isn't it? Yes, as a result of the book, uh, two things have happened. The chief of police has been forced to release um, the partial remnants of the police files from 1962 covering the investigation of Munro's death, which I published uh, in clear in the book, in particular her telephone records. Um, in a rather mad example of bureau bureaucracy gone mad, the police chief has now released them with the numbers censored out, showing Marilyn's calls to Kennedy's Justice Department. Uh, but most recently, and probably most importantly, um, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors has convened a grand jury 
to look into key points raised by the book, in particular what happened on the night she died. It suggests, the, the, the evidence now suggests that far from being found at three or four o'clock in the morning um, by her psychiatrist, that she was in fact either dead or dying four or five hours earlier and was removed initially, alive but in a coma, by ambulance. Uh, Why what, would that take place? Why should anyone want to do that? What would the four or five hours be used for? Uh, it seems, and this is speculation, uh, informed speculation on the basis of the evidence, that the time was used to clear up um, evidence of Marilyn's Kennedy connection at her home, and indeed for Robert Kennedy, who had seen her earlier that day, to be got out of town by, by helicopter. The big question that's being asked about Marilyn's death is, was she murdered? I have not said that she was murdered. The evidence, um, however, isn't clear. Vital forensic materials were thrown away uh, prematurely. I tend to think that this is an example of what I call the cons the uh, screw-up theory of history rather than the conspiracy theory of history, pure inefficiency. However, uh, the story within the story, the, ma the most important thing, I think, for the reporter is that uh, organized crime, and particularly Jimmy Hoffa, the Teamsters Union leader, uh, was at that moment under massive Kennedy prosecution and he had commissioned wiretaps of Marilyn and the Kennedys both in Marilyn's homes on the east and west coast and in the pr home of the president's brother-in-law Peter Lawford. We've got the the man who was commissioned to to do the the bugging the wiretapping, we've got the man who installed the bugs and we've got um, the man who actually monitored the bugs. That happened it was clearly an effort to get smear information on the Kennedys to bring pressure on the presidency. That's the most troubling reporter's story that comes out of the end of Marilyn's life. But who would have an interest in seeing this unhappy woman dead? If there was foul play, and I haven't said there was, I think that we must look to the people who were fully paid up members of the murdering community anyway, it, the organized criminals who were involved in trying to compromise the Attorney General. Could I just ask you this then? Why, 23 years after the event, have some witnesses been prepared to change their stories? I did 600 interviews. Um, that's a lot of slow, hard work. I think that some have talked because 20 years, six years have passed. Peter Lawford, the president's brother-in-law, died last year. That made it easier for some to talk. And uh, others have talked because they see others talking. It's a, it's a continuing roller coaster now, and I think Perhaps, since nobody, incredibly, has ever been put on the stand, nobody's ever been put on oath, there was never an inquest, that perhaps now there is a useful purpose to be served by getting those who survive, who were involved in Marilyn's last hours, to talk on the record formally uh, on oath. For all of the hints of mystery surrounding Marilyn's death, the official investigators didn't feel the need to pursue the case beyond a superficial level. More than likely, there was no crime. And if there was a cover-up, it was merely to hide unwise relationships and not to tarnish our memory of her. The reality is that any attempt to unmask the truth about her last hours remains futile. We must simply accept that Marilyn Monroe took her secrets with her. Sadly, Marilyn's last will and testament revealed she had few friends and even less family. She made her half-sister, whom she had only met a few times, the major beneficiary, and also made provisions for the care of her mother. She gave Lee Strasberg, her psychiatrist, all of her personal effects and clothing and stated, Distribute the effects among my friends, colleagues, and those to whom I am devoted. Instead, Strasberg stored them in a warehouse and willed them to his widow Anna, who in 1999, at Christie's auction house, sell the bulk of Monroe's effects. 800 Some fans were horrified at the thought that her most intimate possessions were being sold for profit by a woman who had never even met Marilyn. But other fans were thrilled at the prospect of owning something that had actually belonged to Marilyn Monroe. The auction earned over $13 million for Anna Strasberg. 
diary shows a different facet to her life. It's the it's her address book that she had, and I think judging by the names in it, um, it's probably dating from 60 to 61, that kind of era, just shortly before her death. So it has a lot of industry contacts in there, um, a lot of her very close and personal friends that she hung out with a lot at that time, and a lot of the doctors that she was seeing as well shortly before her death, which um, is, is the subject of much speculation. There's so many great pieces in the sale. Uh, the things that pop out in my mind are the inter-office memo at the 20th Century Fox legal department saying that Norma Jean Dougherty had just changed her name, had just legally changed her name to Marilyn Monroe. I mean, this is actually the birth announcement of an icon, and that's a fantastic, fantastic item. Release form for the famous nude photographs she did um, that were reproduced on calendars and she signed that one, Norma Monroe, which I have never seen. That's never come up at auction, anything signed Norma Monroe at all, so that's really rare. Classic photographs of Marilyn are also popular all around the world. An exhibition of some of the rarest photographs of Marilyn Monroe went on display at the Smithfield Gallery in London. It featured Bert Stern's last sitting series that was taken shortly before her death. Bert Stern had a retrospective uh, exhibition in Japan in 1995, and because it was so important um, for his career as a, as a photographer, a portrait photographer, um, he included many, well not many, but a, a selection of completely untouched photo black and white photographs. Um, and no editions, absolutely unique. It came uh, as as he took them, so all the hairs on the, on her face and and so on and so forth are still there. A unique collection of photographs called Timeless Beauty also went on display in London at the Andrew Weiss Gallery. This exhibition documented her life from being a very young Norma Jean Baker through to her relationship with Joe DiMaggio and featured the famous Santa Monica Beach photos that were taken by George Barris. Marilyn uh, epitomized beauty and she had an appeal not only for men, which of course that's, we would say would be quite obvious, but she also appealed to, to women as well. And she had a, a way about her that people wanted to just help her and women again found her attractive not in a sexual way but in a way of, of caring and it made it a universal appeal that pulls up to this day. The amount of money fans are willing to pay for images of Marilyn is staggering. When Andy Warhol's orange Marilyn portrait came up for auction it eclipsed all expectations. The Warhol orange Marilyn saying on the turntable on my right at $14,500,000. Florence, you're better at fourteen million five. While people clamor for images of Marilyn, others emulate her. Madonna has been a fan of Monroe since she was a child and has repeatedly styled herself in her image. Gwen Stefani also keeps the Monroe look alive along with fashion designers all around the world, including American designer Yarner Kay. My name is definitely Audrey Hepburn, Marilyn Monroe. That's the icons of the 50s and the 60s, so these girls are amazing, and that's what I'm doing this season. Lebanese designer Zuhair Murad and Italian designers Dolce & Gabbana have kept the Monroe image and style alive on the catwalks of Europe. But no one has gone to the lengths of recreating the Monroe image more than the late Anna Nicole Smith, whose fame also derived from being a Playboy model. She was one of those who loved being in front of the camera and came alive in front of the camera. And um, you know, there was very clearly a Marilyn Monroe quality about her, and uh, that aspiration was very clear from the very beginning. She talked about Marilyn Monroe all, all the time, and when she uh, uh, Became Playmate of the Year for that at that press party. She was doing a lot of a, a lot of Marilyn Monroe poses. 
Anna's deeply held affection for Monroe led to her requesting to be buried next to her idol after her death. And yes, she did mention that once, that she would like to be buried by Marilyn Monroe. She didn't quite have the charm and the universal appeal of Marilyn Monroe, but you cannot deny the parallels in the two of them. From their fake names, to their fake blonde hair, to their nudity in Playboy magazine, to their untimely deaths in their 30s. And you know, we have yet to see at this time what caused Ann and Cole's death, but we can't forget that Marilyn Monroe's death was brought on by an overdose of pills. Marilyn was immortalized when the U.S. Postage Service issued a stamp in her honor. She was chosen to be the first icon of a series of stamps known as the Legends of Hollywood. Being the most famous face in the world would be plenty for a lot of us. The camera loved her, and so did we. But she fought to master her craft and earn the respect of the critics in the same way that she won the hearts of millions of fans. Today, more than 30 years after her death, her comedic style still makes us laugh. Her big girl looks and little girl voice still make us smile. And her incredible beauty still stirs our hearts. There is only one Marilyn. Marilyn Monroe is the quintessential Hollywood superstar. She was a beautiful and intelligent woman, a sex goddess who yearned to be more. It's sad that she couldn't find the heart to love herself in the process. She is a woman who has transcended the ages, Perhaps she simply arrived in this world before her time. It's nice, people knowing who you are and all of that, and feeling that you've meant something to them. The world's fascination with Marilyn Monroe lives on to this day. I thank you very much.